And I'd like to now go to the next slide and Kim, who is going to talk a little bit about how we're going to do the Q&A. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Dr. Losasso. Um, so as you just mentioned, we will get started on the Q&A session um, in just a moment. Just wanted to go over kind of a, a recap of how this Q&A process works. Um, also wanted to mention that this webinar, just like the last webinar, will be saved and uh, is recorded and will be saved on our webinar, I'm sorry, on our website, uh, nestprocedure.com. That should be available uh, within the next week. Um, also, once we, um, right before we get started with the Q&A session, you will see a pop-up um, for a five question poll about the webinar. We do ask that you fill that out just so we can, can help um, with us better better this process for the next time. Um, so just to review uh, the question answer process, um, first of all, we do ask that if you have a, um, a question that's specific to your personal pectus journey, we ask that, um, you don't ask that at this point, that you reach out to me um, at info at nestprocedure.com or um, you can find my phone number on that website as well and give me a call. Uh, probably better to be handled one-on-one -on -one, whether that's with, by, with myself, with Allison or with Dr. Lasasso. Um, and the second part, uh, if it's an insurance question, we ask that you also uh, reach out to the front office for that because um, those questions are, do get a little bit convoluted and are best handled on a one-on-one -on -one approach. Um, so if you do have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, you can do that by um, clicking, right clicking on the participant section um, on the bottom of your screen and then raising your hand. Um, if your question is answered throughout the process, you can feel free to click that button again to um, unraise your hand. Um, we did have two questions come in um, in advance. So I'll go ahead and start with those two questions and then Kate will take over uh, moderating the rest. Um, so Dr. Losasso, um, one of the first questions was, post-op, what should I do in the months, years following the NUS procedure before the bar is removed? Well, that's, that's the ultimate great question as far as I'm concerned, because the, the question implies that the operation is not the end of the process that there is a continuum that goes beyond the operation that is as important as the day of the operation itself. And that continuum, continuum starts with physical therapy that we've already discussed. It's extremely important that, um, that all of you understand that physical therapy is almost as important as a good operation because that's what gets you back to a place where you can have the quality of life that you're you're seeking that you've recovered from the operation that you've regained your strength you've regained your range of motion you 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 are building your uh cardiopulmonary uh, fitness and that is extremely important to do during the first you know eight weeks following the NUS procedure but beyond that it is uh, a three-year journey it, it it continues to be important for a patient to build on what they've done in physical therapy by doing more cardiopulmonary um, uh, uh, exercise. And this can be things as fun as swimming or running or biking or hiking. It doesn't require, you know, doing it in a gym in the era of COVID. Uh, it can be done without a gym. It can be done by a hike. It can be done by a bike ride. It can be done by a swim in a pool. You know, it is important to know that the full cardiopulmonary benefit of the operation is only begun to be realized at a year post-op. Most patients, most 
high-functioning athletes who have come to me start to notice how much better they feel and perform at about a year post-op. So that in and of itself illustrates how important it is to continue to build upon what you've started in physical therapy beyond the physical therapy period. Um, and that includes more cardio, more resistance training, and some uh, work on flexibility. So that can be done in the gym through personal training. It can also be done uh, through personal training, uh, such as Pilates, yoga. Uh, I love those two disciplines because it involves both strength and flexibility. Um, and I think those are two areas that require work for most patients who have had pectus as part of their life journey. So I would just say, continue to do the things you started in physical therapy, continue them through the three years that the bar or bars are in place, and continue to do that as almost a, a, a lifestyle a style change beyond the life of the bars being implanted in one's body. And I think that will really optimize uh, the benefit of correcting the deformity uh, long term. Great, thank you. Um, and then the second question, two part question, uh, why do adults get multiple bars and does that have any restriction on breathing? Great question. So I would say that not every adult needs multiple bars, but most adults need multiple bars. And the way one um, makes that assessment um, is really based on the, on the experience uh, of, the, of the operating surgeon. Um, it is important uh, for that decision of multiple bars to await the operation itself. It's really an intraoperative decision making process. So in summary, an experienced surgeon places the first bar at or near the deepest part of the deformity and then sees how the body responds to that initial intervention, both by looking through a telescope called a thoracoscope inside the chest to see how well the ultimate goal has been achieved, that goal being the elevation of the chest wall off the heart. That you can see. You can appreciate it internally by looking through the thoracoscope, and you can appreciate it externally by looking at how the external chest has responded to that initial bar implantation. And then you go from there. You then escalate therapy until you've reached your objective. Again, that being getting the chest wall off the heart. And so in adults who have heavier, stiffer, deeper deformities and chest walls, that often requires multiple bars. The, uh, the second part of the question, which was uh, how will it affect breathing, is an interesting one. I want to um, try to help uh, patients understand that that there will be some a sense of some restriction in taking a big deep breath but that doesn't mean that one will feel breathless one will feel air hunger that you do not feel you're able to breathe and breathe to the point where you're satisfying your body's need for oxygen. 
what you will feel and what in some patients generates anxiety is that there's some restriction in that maximal deep breath being attained. And so for some patients, that creates anxiety that in my experience um, is addressed most effectively by just letting patients know that they can feel this, they will feel this, and reassure them that this sense of restriction will pass. Initially, the treatment for that is working on chest expansion through doing incentive spirometry, which is a biofeedback technique using a small plastic uh, uh, piece of equipment to, to show the patient how deeply they are breathing and use that as a, as a biofeedback teaching tool to get you to take ever deeper breaths, which tends to help with that sense that you're unable to take an adequate deep breath. That and treating one's pain and muscle spasm effectively early on in the post-operative course also helps to eliminate that feeling, that sense that I can't take a deep breath, okay? But that will pass. It's not worth worrying about. You will get better and never will you ever be in danger of not being able to oxygenate adequately. The operation does not do that to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for getting those answers um, uh, answered. I'm going to pass it over to Kate, who is going to um, call on those that have their hands raised. Hi, guys. First, I'm going to launch our poll here. So you can answer this anytime during the next couple of minutes while people are asking questions. And I'm going to start at the top. So here we go with the poll. If you wanna minimize it, there's a way to click and minimize on the upper left little bar if you're tired of seeing my face. Um, okay, so we're going to go with Joy first. Joy, I'm going to unmute you and lower your hand. You're up next. Hi, thank, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, good. I can, I can hear you, Joy, thank you. Um, I wanted to know if the surgery that you did on the 52 year old was successful and how did they respond to the NUS procedure? Great question. So the 52 year old did excellent. Uh, uh, he did require uh, both those advanced techniques for uh, correcting him. Um, and he did require multiple bars uh, but he did well, he's doing well, um, and um, I, I think it was a, I, I, I can say this without um, any hesitation, it was a life-changing uh, event for him, one that has added an enormous amount of, uh, of life quality to him. And I, I, I think that he actually has been one of those that has been most enthusiastic about the um, response that he got uh, to uh, the operation. Thank you. Steve, Steve, uh, you're up next. I'm going to unmute you. Yes. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me well? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yes. So this is Barbara. Thank you so much for organizing the webinar. Uh, very informative. I have two questions. How long the typical surgery lasts for, for a child, let's say 13, 14 years old, and what are the associated uh, risks and complications after the procedure, which you have witnessed personally and dealt with? Yes. So um, the operation on a child, uh, so 13, 14, we're going to call that a child, um, it generally takes about two to three hours to perform. 
uh, assuming that it, it goes well and there's just a single bar uh, necessary to implant uh, in order to achieve the desired uh, outcome. Um, the the um, uh, complications that are uh, most common, most common, uh, but uncommon in general, most common but uncommon in the scope of most patients includes uh, localized bleeding, meaning swelling in the area where the bar is implanted that is caused by the trauma of implantation that often goes away on its own and sometimes it requires um, aspiration, meaning the insertion of a small needle and the removal of the fluid through the skin. Uh, sometimes it does require taking the patient to the operating room to control the bleeding and to uh, uh, drain the, uh, the fluid. Generally, it's, it, it's old blood, clotted blood that it requires uh, removal. Um, that is a very rare event. I've had to take, to my recollection, only two or three patients back to the operating room to address that kind of a situation in the over thousand patients that I've operated on. So a very rare event. A less rare event that I've seen in my practice is infection. Because you're implanting foreign material, in this case, a metal prosthesis into the body, the incidence of infection is always going to be greater than zero. Um, it's one of those things that befuddles all of us who are in the business of implanting devices into human beings. <laughs> there is always a risk of infection. In my practice, that rate of infection is less than 1%. So it's not even something I see once a year but it is something that happens. When it happens more often than not, it can be treated with just antibiotics. Sometimes it requires a return to the operating room to open the wound, clean the wound, and reclose the, uh, the wound. It, I have never had to remove the hardware, i.e. remove the bar, uh, from a patient who has developed an infection. I've generally been able to manage those most commonly with just the antibiotics and on a rare occasion, go back to the operating room for, for a more um, extensive uh, management of the infected area by opening the wound, cleansing the area around the end of the bar and reclosing. I have never personally injured the heart or the lungs, though in the literature those are known complications. It is a very, very rare complication in general, even rarer in the hands of someone who's doing this operation on a regular basis and has done it extensively. So again, very important to make certain that whomever is treating you or your loved one has done this uh, extensively across a lot of different ages and a lot of different specific types of deformities. Uh, in addition, another complication that is rarely seen but is talked about quite extensively is bar migration, the bar moving, uh, moving from its optimal position in the chest to one that's less optimal. That happens extremely rarely because we've gotten 
really good at anchoring the bars, bending the bars in a way that the bars stay where they are meant to be, and securing the bars that are expertly bent in a way that avoids the bars being unstable and being able to begin to displace. Displacement is generally where the bar uh, migrates in a rotational fashion. Um, when that happens, uh, the bars need to be re-stabilized and that requires re-operation generally. I have never had to operate on any patient of mine to re-secure or stabilize a bar that has been displaced. I've done that for other surgeons. I've done redo operations where the bars have, have displaced. I've gone back and, and repositioned and re-secured uh, bars that have done that. Uh, but I've not personally ever had to do that for any of my own patients. The other thing is uh, allergy to, to bars. Uh, if, if, you're, if your surgeon is not uh, skin testing you and making certain that you don't have an allergy to the alloys uh, that are part of stainless steel, then having an allergic reaction to the bar, which sort of mimics an infection, is something that could occur. Uh, in the days before we skin tested, I did have a couple of patients who had allergic reactions to the bar. Um, uh, that has sub subsequently not recurred in my practice because I take the necessary precautions to avoid that complication. Sasha, are you ready to ask your question? You're next up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, I have two questions. So the first one, in your experience, I guess, would you say that any pectus deformity could be linked to spontaneous pneumothorax? And the second question is specifically pectus arcuatum. Is that um, possible to like correct with the NUS procedure? Two, two great questions. Thank you, Sasha. So starting with the uh, initial question, which is can patients with pectus have spontaneous pneumothorax? And the answer is yes. And the two are linked in that patients with pectus can have, can fall on the spectrum of connective tissue diseases and they also have a tendency to be lean and grow in a very rapid fashion through their peak years of growth around the time of puberty. And as a result of those specific attributes to those with chest wall deformities, developing what's called bleb disease, B-L-E-B, -E is, is actually common amongst patients with pectus and can occur as a result of being such a patient. So it's not uncommon. I, I saw a patient just today in the office that came to me as a result of spontaneous pneumothorax, was treated surgically for that condition, and also has a pretty significant pectus deformity. So today was a day of ensuring that the patient had fully recovered from the surgery for spontaneous pneumothorax, and then discussing with the family uh, the uh, advantages and the indications for going forward and further defining the severity of his associated pectus deformity, and they agreed to do that today. So, so just today in my practice, I had a patient 
with both conditions. So it's not uncommon. As far as your uh, second question, which was, um, uh, can you remind, remind me once one more time? It had to do with- Yeah, um, practice arcuatum. I was wondering if that's yeah. correct about arcuatum. Yes, yes, arcuatum. Thank you so much for reminding me. So arcuatum is a very rare, it's, it's, it's less than 1% of patients. And what makes arcuatum exceedingly complicated is that uh, you never see a lot of it. So you never really are completely, you know, as comfortable with it as you are with other forms of pectus deformity. And because it has uh, uh, components of both major groups of deformity, meaning protrusion and sunkenness, you almost have to address both of those conditions separately, but in concert. By that I mean, you have to define to what extent the deformity is sunken. You do that through the usual and customary workup that I just described to you during the lecture. And then you also have to then determine whether the, deform the sunken component of the deformity requires correction. So, the pectus excavatum or sunkenness needs its own separate evaluation and workup. And then once you've decided whether or not the excavatum portion of the arcuatum requires treatment, then you can discuss with the patient or family how you're going to, how you're going to address the uh, carinatum portion of the deformity. And without going into a lot of detail, that is a separate component of the operation and that involves removing some of the chest wall where it protrudes. So it's a hybrid operation that includes the old Ravitch procedure done in a very modified way in a very minimalistic way, but still removing the cartilages causing the chest, the upper chest to protrude. And at the same time doing a NUS procedure to move the lower part of the chest, which is for sake of argument, uh, significantly displaced um, posteriorly to warrant correction in the way that the NUS procedure corrects that deformity, moving that portion of the chest forward. So um, a very complicated problem, a very rare problem. If anyone in the audience has that form of uh, deformity, it's extremely important that you see somebody who has had experience with this very rare condition. Next up, uh, C. Weinstein, uh, you're next up. I'm going to unmute you. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Hi. Um, I have a two part question and I joined a little late, so I'm sorry. If I, I missed this information. When I when I first joined, you had the, the five part workup. Is that something that we schedule you would schedule an appointment for, and that's all done in your office? Um, that's first question. Second question is, what are the restrictions after uh, a successful surgery? Are, are contact sports a possibility afterwards? Great. So uh, thank you for your question. So. Um, uh, for those of you who came late uh, to the webinar, the webinar will be uh, shown again in its entirety whenever you wish to view it. So it will be um, uh, it will be online through my website, uh, but I will allow Kate, uh, uh, who is uh, our wonderful uh, IT person, to 
um, explain uh, when and how you can access uh, any part of the lecture that you might have missed. Having said that, um, the, the, the workup um, is extremely uh, important. It's done by a multitude of different subspecialists. It's coordinated generally by the person who is uh, uh, treating your pectus and working you up for pectus. So in, 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 my, in my practice, that's me and, and, uh, and Allison, who basically uh, give you uh, a list of individuals, uh, both specific individuals and, and, and categories of, of uh, provider that one needs to seek out in order to complete the workup. So it's, it's basically coordinated by the surgeon, but it's provided by the other subspecialists that have to be part of the surgeon's team. And that includes a radiologist, a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, an allergist, um, and an ophthalmologist, just to name a few. So those individuals either are part of the surgeon's team or will be uh, categories of providers that you in your location will need to, to locate. Um, uh, and and I, I tend to help patients who have difficulty with that part of the process as best I can. I don't know every cardiologist in the United States, but I know centers which are known for having good cardiology departments that uh, are capable of evaluating a patient with a pectus uh, deformity. So, so I or people like me can help you with the referral to those individual subspecialists but it's not done in the same office. It's done in a multitude of offices um, by a multitude of highly skilled specialists. Thank you. And then this, the second part was, um, are contact sports possible after? Yeah. yeah, you were asking a little bit about recovery. So the acute recovery is about uh, uh, two weeks. So you go home, uh, from the hospital after uh, two or three days, uh, you, you convalesce at home, you walk and deep breathe during that period of time. At about two weeks, you come back and see the surgeon. Um, either you see them in person or you do something uh, that is, uh, uh, involves telemedicine so that the wounds can be examined and a conversation can occur to update the surgeon with regards to your recovery and condition. And then, and then there's physical therapy that begins at about three weeks and lasts for two months. That gets you to three months roughly post-op. At that point, I like to check in with my patients. I like to make sure that the physical therapy has gone as well as I would like it to. And I just, you know, reconnect with the patient and find out what their level of, um, of uh, recovery is. And then from there, I generally allow them to start to begin to do sports specific uh, um, uh, workout, workouts uh, and, and uh, um, allow them from month three to month six to begin to slowly work their way back into a place where they participate with their team, if they're doing team sports, or, or, or with their coaches, if they're doing individual sports like track and field. And then eventually at six months, they're able to get back to competition, actual competition within their sports and even if that involves contact sports, 
I'm comfortable at six months if everything has gone well uh, in the preceding six months to clear a patient to pursue sports that involve contact. Not all surgeons feel that way. I will just say that parenthetically. So I think it's important to talk to the, your individual surgeon with regards to what he or she feels most comfortable with regards to releasing you to uh, contact sports activities. But for me, it's six months. Thank you. Hi, Lisa, you're up next. Lisa, can you hear me? Okay, now can you hear me? Perfect, yes, thank, thank you. you. This is Liza. Um, so I wanted to know, does the MRI used for the workup include the use of a dye? And for those who are not severe enough to qualify for the surgery, are there other treatments that can help? Thank you, Liza, great question. So yes, Yes, it does require the administration of dye because you're trying to ascertain flow through the heart. And uh, so it does require the administration of dye in order to do that. But it's, it's different than doing, a, you know, like a, an arteriogram or, or a coronary arteriogram. It, 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 it's, a, it's a different kind of technique, but, but in fact, uh, it's very, very uh, informative with regards to uh, the interaction between the deformity and the flow dynamics through the heart. So it's, a, it's not something that everyone is comfortable doing and interpreting, but in experienced hands, it can provide a lot of, of insight into uh, the correlation between anatomy, pathophysiology, and symptomatology. So it, it, I find it to be extremely, extremely helpful in managing my patients. Um, the other question that you had. If it's not quite as severe. If it's oh, not yes, severe enough to qualify. Yes, so if you don't have a severe deformity. Well, <clears throat> um, Dr. Dr. Nuss talked about exercise, uh, doing deep breathing exercises. There's a lot of information that uh, is online regarding the deep breathing exercises uh, that Dr. Nuss uh, was a big proponent of. Um, uh, in more recent times, uh, people have talked about the vacuum bell, uh, which is a big suction uh, cup that can be placed on the chest externally and used to elevate the chest. Um, and uh, in so doing, uh, help to correct uh, the deformity. Um, I have found with the vacuum bell, uh, it is best done on the very young, and it's best done uh, in order to um, uh, uh, improve very minimal deformities. Uh, I've not found it particularly helpful uh, in older patients with deeper, more fixed deformities, even when those deformities uh, may be even mild in the adult. The reason for that is because the suction bell has a bit of difficulty, you know, uh, elevating uh, the adult chest. That's the first thing. The second thing is it requires a lot of com uh, compliance by the patient to achieve any kind of lasting correction. Even with minimal deformities, you have to leave this bell in place for 30 minutes or more, um, and you need to do it very frequently in order to realize any uh, true correction of the deformity. Um, I know some surgeons use it intraoperatively to elevate the chest. Um, uh, I find the rule track retractor to be much more useful in that regard. 
Uh, so I would, I would, I would suggest, Liza, that you look at the vacuum bell uh, as a um, as a means for correcting a a very minor deformity, especially in a very young person. And by very young, you mean before age twelve, most likely. Correct. Correct. Yeah. 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 Early teens and single digit ages. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Last question, I believe, unless somebody else wants to raise their hand. Kelly, you're up next. Hi. Hi, Kelly. We can hear you. Hi, Kelly. I can hear you. Cool. Um, I um, personally had a arcuatum. Arcu I'm not sure how you say that properly. Um, and had an unsuccessfulness and a successful modified ravage. But my general question is the NUS procedure, are the results vastly different for children compared to adults? As in, what are the success rates, I guess? Would you always push for a child to have the NUS procedure rather than wait as an adult? Great question. Absolutely a great question. So, um, so again, uh, I'll, I'll just briefly address the arcuatum part of your question, which is, as I said before, it's a rare problem. It's an extremely difficult problem. It requires someone very experienced, both in doing the ravage operation and doing the NUS procedure to adequately address that unique condition. So I'm glad to hear that you ultimately had a good outcome. As far as my approach to the NUS procedure, um, I, I, I tend to recommend to families and patients that they have the operation if they qualify and if they want it, because those two things are as important as any two considerations. First and foremost, the patient has got to want to have their chest wall corrected not their mother, not their father, but them as individuals, they have to articulate a, a desire to have the procedure done. And then secondly, they have to have a deformity that meets our standards for patient selection. And that's why I went through the workup so extensively because it's the workup and only the workup done expertly and thoroughly that allows a family and a surgeon to have the kind of conversation that's necessary to identify a patient who would benefit from correction, okay? Once that decision is made, the patient wants it, they, they've had a complete workup, they meet the standards of care to undergo a correction, then I think doing it a bit sooner than later has advantages because you're doing, you're doing it before it fully expresses itself, which happens later in life. You're doing it before the chest becomes heavy and stiff, which makes the correction more difficult as we've discussed and you've avoided you know the further disfigurement of allowing the child to continue to grow in a way that is abnormal so you're not correcting something that is late in its stages of disfigurement you're intervening at a time when it clearly needs to be fixed, it needs the standard to be fixed, the child or parents together want it to be fixed, and by doing it slightly sooner than later, you can generally get both a better cosmetic and functional outcome. So I'm a proponent for doing it earlier in your teen years than later in your teen years for those reasons. Thank you very much.
Alex Bell, you're up next if you have a question. Can you? Hi, <clears throat> hi. This is actually a follow up to what Liza had asked. What is the cutoff of, for severity where you would not consider the NUS procedure in layman's terms? And um, I also wanted to know uh, how severe the deformity would have to be before it would have a significant effect on your lung capacity. Great. So um, uh, the, let's take the latter first. So um, uh, it's important for you to understand that you can have a, a, a severe deformity that will result in some diminution of lung function. That is possible. But the vast majority of patients who are symptomatic are symptomatic not from the effect of the sunken chest on the lungs, but rather its effect on the heart. Okay, that's important for everyone to understand. Even though your symptoms sound like they're uh, related to your respiratory system, meaning you're short of breath and sh short of breath when you exercise, it's really symptoms of that sort related more to the inefficiency of circulation between heart and lungs caused by the deformity than an actual effect on, on your lungs, okay? Having said that, the way one defines severity is really twofold. One is to look at the actual measurement based on the MRI of the deformity's degree of sunkenness. That's called your Haller index or your severity score. That's measured by the distance from side to side divided by the distance from front to back. In a normal person, that should be two. You're twice as wide as you are deep. In a patient who qualifies by standards of care set by experts in the field, one needs to exceed the threshold of 3.25. However, it's more than just a number. It's that number and the other aspects of the workup that were that are important, almost equally important. Do you have any abnormalities of your pulmonary function testing? Do you have any diminution of your um, exercise uh, physiology as measured through a metabolic stress test? Do you have evidence on the MRI of, of altered circulation between your heart and your lungs. So it is a composite of, of findings that help a thoughtful surgeon to arrive at a recommendation that a patient would be, uh, would be, would be best served or would be helped by having a correction of their deformity. So it's not just the Haller index. It's not just one number, though that number is 3.25. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think that wraps up our evening tonight. Thank you, Dr. Lasasso, for your time and for everyone who attended today. This transcript and recording will be up online within the next week. In addition, if you have not taken a chance to fill out the poll, which you might have minimized down at the bottom of your screen, we would love it if you could do so. It gives us some insight into this. Dr. Lasasso, do you have any final words? I would just like to thank everyone for their interest uh, in the subject. And for those of you who, um, uh, who have children with pectus or 
personally have pectus, I just want to say to you, um, there is hope for you to have an excellent outcome um, with regards to a correction of your condition. And I want to encourage you to believe that there's someone out there skilled and knowledgeable enough to help you, that you need to spend the time to find that individual and be assured that an answer to the issues that are created by your deformity can be addressed and addressed in a very, very constructive way. Your expectation should be that you could live a normal life with good quality of life and an acceptable cosmetic result um, if you um, find the right person uh, to address your condition and your needs. So I would encourage everyone to, um, and I wish for everyone, that kind of experience and thank you again for your interest and I hope this was helpful to you all. Stay well and uh, look for us to be back within the next month with another topic. Have a good night and be well.